Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to UCSF Medical Grand Rounds. This is our first of the year. I hope everybody had a nice vacation and is surviving the weather out there. Uh, be careful uh, because this is all electronic. Uh, also, we're prepared for things to go down, but if they do, uh, don't be surprised. We see some scrambling right now. Everybody seems to have electricity, so we're, we're going to go forward. Um, everybody knows the ground rules, uh, but uh, closed captioning is available. If you're in CME credit, stay on till the end. Lakshmi uh, Santosh, who runs these sessions, is, uh, is tweeting out some of the highlights as well. And we will post this on YouTube, as has been their habit for now, uh, coming up on four years um, later tonight. Um, this is back to something we did a lot of early in the pandemic, which is just bring together three or four of our favorite experts to talk about the state of the pandemic. I think it's an interesting stage where a new variant is uh, is emerging and rapidly taking over. There's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen with that variant and how the new booster is working, um, uh, how severe is the variant, what the impact is of it on uh, on hospitalization and death. Uh, we have the triple demic idea, although it seems like things have calmed down a little bit with flu and RSV. So we'll talk about all of those things. Uh, with four of our world-class uh, speakers. Uh, the first will be Peter Chen Hung, who's Professor of Medicine in our Division of Infectious Disease at UCSF Health. He's also Associate Dean for Regional Campuses, and uh, Peter is a renowned expert in COVID and a terrific uh, public and professional communicator about it. He's also a uh, superb teacher and is the inaugural holder of the Academy of Medical Educators Endowed Chair for Innovation in Teaching. So uh, Peter and uh, Monica Gandhi, who's next, uh, we'll be uh, we'll talk about some of the general issues first. And Monica, who everybody knows by now, is Professor of Medicine, Associate Chief of our Division of HIV, Infectious Diseases and Global Medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, where she also runs the HIV clinic. She also is director of the UCSF Gladstone uh, Center for AIDS uh, Research, and she's an internationally known leader in uh, in public health and public communication uh, and epidemiology as it pertains to. Uh, HIV, but now uh, very much so in COVID. So Peter, Monica, and I will have a initial discussion about some general issues, and then we will uh, pivot to two, uh, two issues that I wanted to focus on specifically. Uh, the next speaker will be Annie Lukemeyer, who's professor of medicine in the Division of HIV, ID, and Global Medicine at the county. Uh, and Annie is a renowned expert in all things therapeutics, uh, again, like many people, focusing mostly on HIV and other viral infections in the old, old days, but uh, for the last several years, a lot of her attention being focused on, uh, on COVID. So we'll bring Annie on at about 25 minutes after to talk about therapeutics with a particular focus on outpatient therapeutics, the role of Paxlovid, the uh, receding role of monoclonals, and a few other things. And then uh, last but very much not least, we'll bring on Steve Deeks. Steve is another professor in the same division. I won't go through all the names again, uh, but uh, Steve is an international leader in HIV-associated immune uh, dysfunction, uh, one of the world's leading researchers in the role of viral infections and the immune system. And of course, <clears throat> like all of us, has pivoted to spending a lot of his time and energy <clears throat> thinking about uh, uh, COVID in that context. Uh, with a particular focus on long COVID, what we've come to learn about the science of it and to some extent the therapy uh, therapies for it. So we'll bring Steve on at the end, probably at about 1240 to 1245 to talk about long COVID and what we've learned. There's a lot of new data coming out. So that's the agenda, a lot to do and cover. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And let me bring Monica and Peter out first to have kind of a general discussion about where things are uh, with the pandemic. Well, let's start with just general questions. Why don't you describe what, when somebody asks you what's going on with COVID these days, what do you tell them? Well, um, you know, we, we've seen this phenomenon before with uh, decoupling between tons of COVID in the community, a uh, new variant, like you mentioned, uh, XBB and XBB 1.5, uh, but, you know, not too much action in the hospitals, uh, including UCSF. So uh, with a mortality rate that's kind of dipping to one of the lowest I've seen per day in the United States, but still relatively high, some experts may argue. Uh, you would say that we're kind of weathering for now uh, what we're seeing uh, pretty decently. Okay, Monica, why don't you go ahead and give us your sort of big picture take and then we'll drill into some of the issues. 
Yeah, I agree with Peter that the WHO yesterday gave a press conference, the first of their year, and essentially they spoke of monkeypox, COVID, and the Ebola outbreak in Uganda, and said that we're in incredibly good places with all of them, um, except for China with COVID-19. Uh, the incredibly high rates of immunity worldwide, both from vaccination and a lot of natural infection from all the different variants and subvariants of Omicron over the last six months has led to a very high degree of population immunity. Deaths are down from COVID 90% over the last two months um, worldwide. And essentially, the WHO said they're likely to declare the end of the pandemic um, soon. Now, they are very concerned about China, as are we all, because the only place that the rates of uh, immunity are unlikely to be as high is that country because of low rates of natural immunity because of the COVID zero approach and then kind of differing um, uh, statistics on rates of vaccination in the elderly, which would be the most important factor. 70% above 60 says the BBC, 90% says Shanghai. So I think that's the place that now the WHO is worrying about. So uh, let's sp spend a second on China. Um, I, I, actually, I'm surprised how low the vaccine rate is. You would think in a society where there's so much central control that they would have figured out a way of, they obviously controlled a lot of this, including you know massive lockdowns. Why is the vaccine rate lower, as low as it is? And is it just the rate or is it the fact they were using a vaccine that's not as good as the ones that we're using? Well, I can start. Uh, I yeah. think part of the interesting uh, aspect with Chinese elderly, the Chinese elderly population is that uh, the when China rolled out their trials in their Sinopharm, Sinovac vaccines, they only studied it and and sort of like promoted it for the workforce, which was uh, you know indicated ages eighteen to fifty nine. So what that what that led to was a lot of misinformation in the elderly population, like. Was it because uh, they had other comorbidities that the vaccine wasn't safe? Was it because uh, it, they didn't really need to worry? And I think what we saw in Hong Kong in January of 2022 was a, is a dress rehearsal for what might be happening or will happen in China, which is very similar uh, culture, very similar views in the LA towards vaccines and not a lot of promotion historically in that population in China, mainland China, as well in Hong Kong. That led to Hong Kong having, and continues to, I think, hold the record for one of the highest mortality per 100,000 uh, in any municipality in the world. Mm -hmm. And I can speak, yeah. yeah, to the vaccine, because I've been really looking at kind of the global vaccines. It's Sinopharm and Sinovac are inactivated whole virus vaccines. Um, and so is Covaxin in India, but Covaxin is linked to an adjuvant that was developed by the um, NIH. So it's actually a very powerful adjuvant. So let's separate those out. Sinopharm and Sinovac do raise immunity and any immunity is better than none. And in fact, the phase one, two trials did raise T cell immunity quite well. Um, so, you know, use what you have, but it really does need boosting um, uh, in terms of the elderly. And so I would think of it as a three dose uh, regimen as opposed to a two dose. So I wouldn't just say, oh, vaccination in the elderly. I would say vaccination and boosting. Mm -hmm. Just like in Hong Kong, as Peter was referring to in January 2022, South Korea had really high rates in the elderly of the third dose. North uh, Hong Kong had lower rates, much more um, deaths in Hong Kong. And then we had to think about public health trust. If you keep your society that closed down such that protests erupted, such that people died in a fire um, because there was welding in a house. Um, you know, there is distrust in public health um, in this country, around the world, but very concentrated, I think, in a place like China. Mm -hmm. Monica, you mentioned that the rate of immunity in the U.S. is incredibly high from vaccines and, uh, and infection. And I've seen some statistics say that that, you know, the vast, vast majority of us have been infected. If you take someone like me who does not think that he has had COVID at this point, what are the chances that I actually have had it? 
if, if I got it. <laughs> That's actually a great question. And I think it can be answered. I also, um, you know, haven't had a documented COVID infection and you and I, um, you know, maybe have approached things differently, but I also haven't had COVID, um, but I may have. And so how do we know this? You have to look at nucleocapsid antibodies. And that would say that you've had natural infection, right? Because spike protein antibodies are the ones that are generated by the vaccine or natural infection. Now, there was interestingly a study by the CDC, a seroprevalence study published on March 29th that I didn't think got as much attention as I thought it would, um, that 95% of us in the United States have had spike IgG. So either, you know, vaccination or natural infection. The nucleocapsid antibody, the last time they gave us the statistics was 86% in children in August. And they haven't given us good statistics in adults, but it looks like at least 70%. So you would have to, um, you know, IHME up in Seattle has estimated 75% of us in the U.S. have seen COVID. So you'd have to do your nucleocapsid antibody. Okay. But there's no, no, no study that it looks at people that don't think they've had it, have never had clinical COVID and tested them for the antibody to see whether they've had it. Actually, there was. Um, this was in JAMA. Um, this was published by a Johns Hopkins group about actually quite a long time ago. It was before Omicron. And um, about half of people who had nucleocapsid antibodies didn't know they had had it. Mm -hmm. And in the setting of um, of Omicron, there was another JAMA paper that 56% of um, Omicron infections were asymptomatic. So you not knowing you have it is very, if someone doesn't know they've had it, that's a very common phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, Peter, let's, let's pivot to the this new variant. Seems like it's it's taking over and very clearly is going to be the, the lead dog soon, if it's not already. Uh, tell us what we know about it in terms of the things we've gotten used to querying about variants, its infectiousness, its immune evasion, and its severity. Yeah, so the, in terms of what we know about uh, XBB and its sibling XBB 1.5, uh, it certainly seems to be more transmissible uh, because it's displacing some of the most transmissible uh, variants that we knew so far about, i.e. BQ1, BQ1.1, children of BA5, essentially. Um, uh, number two, uh, is it... Um, vaccine evasive. Um, it certainly from uh, studies uh, from done in China, Japan, uh, elsewhere, it seems to be a little bit more immune evasive. Uh, I'll just give that global comment and we can dive into depth some more. Um, and then number three, uh, does it cause more severe disease? Well, it all depends on the soil on which that scary looking variant falls on. Um, you know, that aspect of does it cause more serious disease is so variable right now. Uh, you can go from an elderly person in China where it can decimate them to a multiply experienced uh, resident of San Francisco where it would be very, very uh, benign. So I think uh, it is uh, an Omicron uh, sublineage, so to speak. So we don't think that intrinsically it will unlock uh, those receptors and get into the lungs quite as easily, but nevertheless, it can still cause serious uh, damage. So th that's kind of where we sit with those three questions. We do have um, natural history uh, knowledge from India and Singapore back in October and the fall of 2022, because XBB was actually very uh, common there and, and fueled a surge, a mini surge in both of these two countries. But uh, from the preliminary data, it didn't seem to result in a disproportionate uh, a number of folks going to the hospital compared to other sublineages. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where we are. It sounds like that's also what we're seeing in the Northeast, that even though it's incredibly prevalent, a lot of infections, hospitalization rates don't seem to be skyrocketing. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and then the only difference between XBB and XBB 1.5, it's sort of souped up very um, uh, sibling is that uh, there's this uh, mutation uh, F486P where it just makes it much more uh, easily able to uh, infect another cell compared to XBB. Monica, anything you want to add? By the way, Peter, do you remember all those letters and numbers or you have a little post-it note there? I don't usually remember it, but for F486P, I did write it down so I can okay. sound intelligent. I, I, like I, I had, had to be. Okay. Monica, what, what else would you add? 
Yeah, the only uh, other thing I'd add is this is actually an offshoot of BA2 um, and not the BA5 family like the BQ1 and the BQ1.1 were. And so when we're thinking, okay, what do we mean by immunovasive? Well, we mean that the antibodies don't work as well, but we've talked a lot about in medical ground rounds why um, severe disease is still protected against even with Delta, even with Omicron BA1. BA2, BA2, 12, 1, BA4, BA5, all of them because our T cells and our B cells still work um, against these subvariants. And so the question um, becomes, well, new, the new bivalent booster, which was directed against BA4, BA5, there were some antibody studies that show that they um, gave nicer antibody responses to BQ1 and BQ11, which would totally make sense because they're offshoots, they're children of BA4, BA5. So XBB, XBB um, 1.5, we may need to rely again on our T cells and our B cells to, um, and probably any booster will do, um, mm. as opposed to the bivalent booster specifically. And um, that's what happened in India. Again, I think everyone's sort of coalescing on kind of a common understanding that older people need the booster the most, um, either yearly, uh, right now in high circulation, maybe even six months. I mean, you need a booster if you're older. I would kind of cut the, do that age cutoff at 65. So, so the sort of general understanding that we've had for maybe the better part of a year that the booster re restores some of your protection against infection, but it only lasts a couple of months and significantly restores your protection against a severe case that lasts for much longer than that, in some ways a little bit unknown sort of how long. Is that still accurate with this new variant because of this, the idea that uh, that it's coming from a different lineage than a BA5. In other words, you said the T cells and B cells are still working, which I assume is helpful against severity, but is the booster no longer particularly helpful or do we not know in terms of infection? Yeah, to be fair, um, I doubt this booster is going to significantly reduce infection because we saw with the old ancestral strain booster in BA1 that there was kind of a massive opening. Everyone get boosters. And in the populations that got boosters, we didn't see significant reduction in infection. And that was against BA1 because you're already at the ancestral strain. So mm -hmm. these antibodies are simply not working as well. That was the old booster. Now we have a new booster, but again, these antibodies are not going to work as well against XBB um, 1.5 because it's not the right offshoot. So just keep on thinking who needs to be boosted. I think if we go towards a strategy of a booster is there to prevent severe disease, then we are going to go like the WHO has recommended as of yesterday and also back in March, that the people who need regular boosting are going to be older, vulnerable. Lancet study in the UK, 30 million people who got two doses and they figured out who needed a third dose. Those over 80, those with five comorbidities, those on immunosuppressants and those with chronic renal failure. And it was those four groups that benefited from the third shot. So likely the WHO, they've already made this recommendation, older vulnerable people every year. And then younger people, what, no I, booster period? Likely not until they get to that age. At least, that, again, that is what the WHO has made an official recommendation of. Um, again, every country's doing it differently. Denmark said the same thing as the WHO. They're only at 65. Um, our country is saying get boosted from the age of six months on. Uh, every, well, we're the only uh, country, we're an outlier um, with that young of a booster. Every country's kind of coming up with a different age, but the WHO that speaks for the planet and India I would say did really well with XBB and they boost everyone over 60 mm -hmm. once a year. So if I'm 50 something, I would wait till I'm 60 to get my next booster according to the WHO recommendations. Right. Is that, is that your belief as well, that that's the right strategy? I mean, it is I, I, actually. I say my, you know, my take on it is, is, is that partly a resource question? Because if I'm 50, even a small benefit in terms of decreasing severity might still be meaningful. The question is, does it also lower the probability of long COVID? We can ask Steve that later. Um, do you buy that? And, you know, the recent uh, study from some of our colleagues showing it lowers uh, infectiousness as well. Um, you know, there, there are other advantages of getting it beyond just preventing. Uh, this study on lowering infectiousness, I think, is really important to just comment on. This was from Nathan Lowe and his group in Nature Medicine just published this week that a vaccine lowers your rate of transmission um, by 20 to 21%, like 21% trans. Um, lowered it to 21%, infection, recent infection, 21%, and the combination of both 
reduce transmission by 42%. So I'm never going to encourage people to go out and get infected and they get a boost to lower transmission. It's not really the strategy to lower transmission. And I'm really concerned about that loss of public health trust that if we overpromise the vaccines. And the reason I'm so concerned is as an infectious disease doctor, measles is freaking me out. Polio is really worrying me. Um, you know, I'm worrying about that loss of trust in public health. So I try to say the limitations of the vaccines clearly. Mm -hmm. So part of your motivation to not push it for younger people is just, you don't think the benefits very much at this point, since everyone has some immunity and- I want them know, to get their measles vaccine. <laughs> yeah, yeah you rather, that get, trust. Rather, exactly. rather than focus on other things yeah. that you think have a higher yield, yeah. as opposed to being saying it has no benefit at all. It may have a small benefit at the margin, but it feels like it's marginal at this point for a younger. And I think insurance companies, when we go away from the public health emergency in this country, are going to make decisions yep. on resources that are made on science. All right. Peter, any comments on, on all that? I mean, I, I would say age is probably the, the easiest thing to put into public policy. But like Monica mentioned, the other groups, you know, have the vulnerable groups have to be sort of given an opportunity to get it as well, which I think they will. And but at the end of the day, I think the public, even, uh, uh, you know, people who are tired of getting boosters would probably accept a once yearly uh, shot. And if you have a combination influenza mRNA and a COVID booster mRNA, one needle, uh, that might be where the U.S. might settle to. Uh, but I agree, if I had st been stuck in a desert island, I had one group to pick, it would be those over 60. All right, but you're not. So so let's say a 40-year-old healthy friend of yours says, my last shot was 10 months ago. Should I get the booster? What do you tell them? Well, you know, it depends on their situation. I always tell people that I not only think about, uh, and, and this might diverge a little bit from Monica, although I, I totally agree with her in spirit. It depends on who you are and, and the company you keep. And if you live with somebody who's, elderly and maybe they refuse to get a booster or maybe you're not really sure, you might probably feel better getting it. It's certainly not going to be harmful and it's probably not going to be as evidence-based as giving it to somebody over 60. But there are, there are a lot of other aspects in someone's life that I think about when- Just, when just the individual risk-benefit decision for a healthy 40-year-old. You'd say at this point, the need, let's say, to get that yearly booster, let's say we're, we're, next, we're next September, you would recommend for it or against it? I, they're not, I'm not living with a 90 year old. I'm not immunosuppressed. Yeah. I'm a reasonably I, healthy person. I think that if that person has already gotten three shots, they're probably unlikely to benefit further than uh, more than three shots, even you know, you know, at some, at this point anyway, based okay. on the evidence that I know. Sounds like Monica, you're, that's that would be your recommendation as well. Yeah, that seems to be the evidence so far. Okay. Um, let's talk precautions for a second. Either of you still wearing masks? And if so, where and when and why? Peter, you want to start? Um, I'm still wearing a mask. Um, you know, I, I, I travel, well, people can tell I, I, I'm, I've been traveling recently for the holidays and on the plane going on and off the plane uh, in TSA lines, I'm still wearing a, a mask. I'm um, proud of indoor areas, but not, you know, not on, on an average place um but you know that's that's kind of where I'm, average uh, place so i see you when i see you in the safeway you're gonna be wearing a mask or not if i'm going in and out of safeway i'm probably not going to be wearing a mask so but if, if i'm on, going to go in there for a long time yeah you're on the express line you're not if you're on the, the regular line you might be all right monica yeah. how about you you know, I've really looked into the mask data. I feel like um, we only talked about masks for the first year because there's nothing else to talk about. And I think it did decrease the severity of disease, but that became immaterial to me after we got vaccines. I do really trust the vaccines. And I don't think that, um, um, you know, uh, that, that after you've been vaccinated that you necessarily need to wear a mask. Um, and I also have really thought about the type of mask. Mm -hmm. um, and really, we just have that, again, that public health distrust problem that I'm interested in combating. And so the cloth masks, um, you know, don't, they, they just don't have, it's just easy to get the particles of virus through them. Um, and so that's what really school children are wearing. So just recommending mask mandates in schools with that Paw Patrol <laughs> picture on I'm it. Not, just, I'm not talking about mask mandates and I'm not talking about cloth masks. I'm talking yeah, about but I, so you, I think that's the KN95 at yeah, the same time. Yeah, KN95, exactly. FFP2, KF94, and N95. So that's and what I'm if you want to wear a mask. I personally am not masking. I feel really You're not masking on an airplane? Yeah, I feel really comfortable with my vaccines. Not even on an airplane? Even on an airplane. Got it. Okay. 
Um, so maybe the last couple of questions. With the new variant, people are, you hear lots of Twitter chatter about pretty much everything, but one is that the, that the tests don't work anymore. The rapid tests don't work anymore. True, not true. Monica? Um, I don't, that's not true. I don't think it's true because of course PCR depends on the primer, but we should really be switching to antigen and there's still viral antigens in there that pick up part of this virus. So it may require two tests, um, but I don't think that's true. Okay. Uh, Peter, anything to add? Um, I, I think uh, combining a throat and nose is something that I will continue to advocate for people. Um, uh, it makes no sense to me that early on, if you have a lot of throat symptoms and you're swabbing your nose, that it will, the test will be as sensitive. But of course, repeating it, like Monica uh, said, is, is what I'd also do. Okay. And for those of us that are still kind of tracking to see how much COVID there is in the air to help guide decisions about things like masking, I saw some recent data that says that the case rates now are not tracking the wastewater rates the, the way they used to. So A, is that, do you know that that's true? And B, what do you track to see how much COVID there is in the environment, assuming it would change your behavior? Monica, it sounds like in your case, it wouldn't. And Peter, it sounds like in your case, it might on the line at the airplane and on the long line at Safeway. I, I would say another aspect that hasn't been brought up yet is I wear a mask. I've worn a mask for winter in some situations, not just for COVID, but for the sum of the parts of everything. I mean, who wants to be sick with anything like a cold or influenza? So that's kind of what drives my mask wearing, not just, mm -hmm. you know, solely COVID. Got it. Got it. And in terms of um, uh, sort of what you track to see how much COVID there is in, 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 in the air, first of all, does that matter to you? Or, and second of all, if it is, what, what are you following? I think that, that that's a tough situation. Certainly, I look at the trend again. Um, you know, is it what's the slope of the graph rather than the actual absolute number? And I look at all these things, but there's nothing really that really um, is that uh, compelling to me as, as truth anymore. I look at a variety of metrics and at the end of the day, look at, uh, yeah, I mean, hospitalizations might be the, the most distal, one of the more distal measures, but that's mm -hmm. something I, I look at too. Okay. I uh, want to move on to Annie in a second. Maybe let, uh, people are asking about the risk of indoor dining. It sounds like, Monica, you're not wearing a mask anywhere, and it sounds like you're comfortable in all settings. So you, I assume you're comfortable in indoor dining? Yeah, I, I, you know, one thing I want to mention is that this concept that we can eradicate COVID, um, I think, did a lot of harm. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of a student of infectious disease history just because I just love ID so much. I thought about a lot about um, the history, right? And so we've only eradicated one virus worldwide, which is um, smallpox in humans, killed cattle to eliminate rinderpest, but we're not going to do that. And in none of the features that smallpox had does COVID have. We have multiple animal reservoirs, almost 30. We have pre-symptomatic spread. It looks like other viruses and that we don't get sterilizing immunity even from infection. So um, all of that put together will never eradicate COVID. It is why the, the, the people of China did protest and say, this is just reality. And we have to get our severe disease rates down. That is our purpose in life. That's what the WHO said yesterday. And that means it's vaccinating older people, boosting older people, vaccinating everyone, getting treatments that Annie's going to talk about, including this exciting new one um, that just got uh, published in the New England Journal last week. It's vaccines and treatments, but looking at case rates and thinking you can eradicate COVID, to be honest, I think was one of the most strongest pieces of misinformation that we had from this pandemic and it caused damage. Okay, I mean, I wouldn't frame it that way, but that's the different opinions that, I mean, you can, you can look at case rates, make decisions about behavior without saying we're gonna eradicate COVID. It it's is not that, it's just that we'll never know, like people don't test anymore, people aren't recording their tests. And so I do think that wastewater surveillance is important, but to know that the most important thing you have to do is keep up with your vaccines and tr get treatment if you're more at risk. To me, it makes it really simple actually. And mm -hmm. it, to me, it feels like HIV. We had treatments and we moved on. Mm -hmm. And it's important to think about how important these biomedical advances are. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, let's go on to Annie. Thank you both. And uh, we'll bring Annie on now. And 
topic is outpatient, largely outpatient therapeutics. And, you know, we've emphasized vaccinations and masking and probably haven't spoken as much as we should about uh, the state of therapeutics, which is changing quite a bit. And Annie uh, is going to talk to us for a few minutes about that, then we will open it up. So, Great. Annie, you're on. Thanks so much. Um, hopefully I technically navigated that. And I just wanted to start with a cartoon from Roz Chast, who I really love from The New Yorker, um, maybe summarizing how I think we're all feeling about COVID and maybe the news cycle in general. But I thought this was a nice way to start, which is that we all get a little freaked out, but then we, then we, then we get to the oh well stage of things. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, I wanted just to talk for a minute about what we no longer have. Um, I think Monica and, uh, and, and, and Bob and Peter went through nicely how XBB and in particularly XBB 1.5 has really uh, become the predominant variant in the United States. And uh, one of the consequences of this is that there's now no expected activity of the two monoclonal antibodies that we had prior to this. So one is bebtilavimab, which is used for treatment, um, and that actually was rescinded by the FDA for now um, and perhaps forever. Um, so it's not currently authorized in any U.S. region because all of the current variants are not expected to have any, uh, not expected to be treated by bebtilavimab. I think also quite worrisomely, Evusheld, so tixagevimab, silgavimab, which is the only medication that we had that was used for prevention, and this is given just as a reminder once every six months to people who are at really high risk is also expected to have no activity. Um, now, the FDA hasn't pulled the authorization for Evusheld, um, but I, I, and it was holding on, I think, by its fingernails for a while, and I think now uh, really very little efficacy. It may be that the, one of the reasons why this hasn't been pulled is because we have no other options, um, and it's likely not going to cause harm, although there, you know, it's a, it's a resource issue, but I think uh, it's really a lot to, to lose one of the only pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, prevention tools that we have. And I'll talk about this in a, in a minute, but we don't really have a great clear timeline for new monoclonals. Um, so what do we have? Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly, and this is just a snapshot from the NIH treatment guidelines. There's also some really nice guidelines from um, the IDSA. Um, these were updated just a week ago. And so we have Paxlovid, we have remdesivir, and we have molnupiravir for outpatients. So Paxlovid, what do we know in the Omicron vaccinated era, which we are in? Um, so we've got much less severe disease, as I think was really nicely hi um, highlighted. So overall, your risk of being hospitalized um, uh, and having uh, progression to severe disease is much, much lower. Um, but importantly, I think real world data um, show us that Paxlovid still reduces the risk for severe disease, particularly if you're uh, over 65. I think age has really emerged as one of the strongest risk factor. Some data suggest over the age of 50 or have another risk factor um, that puts you uh, uh, at elevated risk. And I'm not going to go through those data, but I think there's some really nicely done um, real world studies, including a recent MMWR. Well, what about symptoms? You know, if you have a low risk of being hospitalized, we all really do, you don't wanna end up in the hospital, but you'd like to feel better. Um, and I wanna just highlight some data that came out from ID Week this year, which is from the EPIC HR study. And just a reminder, that this was a registrational trial for high risk patients. And it was done, you know, in the non-Omicron era and in unvaccinated patients. So it's not exactly applicable um, to where we are now, but it was pretty marked to see that there was a three day reduction in the time to symptom resolution, you know, um, so people felt better faster and also in the time to symptom alleviation, which I'm not showing here. But I think this was really heartening to see because we don't have a lot of great data about whether the medicines make you feel better sooner, which is um, also something that we would really like to have. Long COVID, I'm gonna to defer to uh, Dr. Deeks, but there was an intriguing preprint from the VA that suggested that treatment, um, uh, at least in the vet population, may reduce the risk of long COVID. And we'll hope that Steve can sort this out for us. I think some controversy around that paper. Well, what about the downsides? We've heard a lot of downsides of uh, Paxlovid that we've gotten to hear more about. So rebound, viral rebound and symptom rebound, um, they're real, um, hard to know exactly how often they occur. And I would say that dysgeusia or that bad taste Pax mouth is real. In a recent study, it was about 25% of people reported um, having dysgeusia. 
I don't think either of these are reasons not to prescribe Paxlovid, particularly in people who are at high risk or um, uh, who are older, um, but certainly people need to be aware that these are possibilities. And I know that many people have chosen to avoid taking Paxlovid because they don't want to deal with possible rebound um, or dysgeusia. We know that there's pesky drug interactions. Most of these can be managed, but they are a pain um, and they do uh, preclude some people from taking Paxlovid. I think really importantly, you have to give medications within the first five days and the sooner is better. It's just hard for a lot of people, this you know, being diagnosed quickly um, often isn't the case. So just a reminder, if you're thinking about being treated for um, COVID, you know, get diagnosed, it's fine to use a home test um, and, and then reach out as soon as you can. What about access? Um, so there's still these medications, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir are available at no cost. But I just want to put on the radar that, um, you know, when the public health emergency ends, and we don't know when that is, it keeps being extended piecemeal, and when there's full FDA approval for Paxlovid, and this also has been delayed, it was pushed back till May of this year for the review, I think there's just a real concern um, that there'll be a expected increase in disparities for access with those who for no or limited insurance because they may be charged um, for these medications. Um, and I think this is really problematic because one thing that we know is that for people who really need these medicines and may benefit from them, who are at higher risk, that the uptake um, is well below what we would what we would like to see. Um, and we do still see people getting um, hospitalized or having um, you know long lasting symptoms. Um, so we haven't done a great job of getting the meds to people who need it. And I, for one, am really worried that our issues with the disparities that exist will be exacerbated um, if we start charging for uh, Paxlovid uh, and the vaccines. Um, for that matter. What about the other two options that we have that I mentioned? Um, so one is molnupiravir. This is an oral medication. And we know that in the uh, pre-Omicron era, um, it show, showed less efficacy than Paxlovid, although not head to head. Um, I did want to point out, though, that there's some really interesting data from the panoramic study that showed very convincingly that molnupiravir was associated with a market reduction in time to first recovery, so nine days versus 15 days, and this was quite statistically significant. So again, if you're in the market for the medications to reduce symptoms, I think there's um, reasonable data to support use of molnupiravir, um, particularly, again, in those who are at higher risk. It has no drug interactions, so that is a really something to consider, particularly for people who are taking you know, immunosuppressants that may have lots of drug-drug interactions. The downsides, as we've talked about, are concerns for possible teratogenicity, and it shouldn't be given to people under the age of 18. Um, again, due to the mechanism of action, some concerns about cartilage that's still developing. And like PACS, it has to be given within five days of symptoms. But my take home for molnupiravir, which I think sometimes gets really a, a, a bad rap, is that it's a very reasonable alternative to Paxlovid for those who need treatment due to an elevated risk for disease progression. What about IV remdesivir? Um, and again, uh, data that we have for reducing the progression of severe disease looked really similar to Paxlovid pre-Omicron, so, so quite good. It was a, a high 80% reduction in uh, hospitalization and death. We don't have um, great data for Omicron era, um, uh, including symptom data, um, but we do know remdesivir well and, and are very familiar with it. Um, on the upside, you can be given um, up to seven days after symptoms and diagnosis has been made, and there are limited drug drug interactions. But I think the real Achilles heel here is that it's an IV administration that has to be given for three days. And so that's really limited um, the availability. It was tough for many programs to get um, monoclonals up and going, which is just a one-time administration. And then you're tripling the issue here by requiring three days of IV um, administration. So it's challenging. So my take home for IV remdesivir is it's a really great option for those at high risk if you can get it. But I don't expect that this is going to be widely available in many settings um, in the U.S. Um, and outside of the U.S. Um, what's next? Um, and I included this picture from the recent Diego Rivera um, exhibit, which was really wonderful uh, here at the San Francisco MoMA, um, looking at the horizon. A bunch of agents, um, and I just snapshotted a few. There's a number of oral remdesivir analogs that are in development. Monica mentioned one that was just um, published in the New England Journal. Gilead has an oral remdesivir analog that's in development, and there's several others um, that are out there. We all would like something oral with less um, drug-drug interactions, and certainly there's been a good track record of IV remdesivir um, in terms of efficacy. 
For the protease inhibitors, would love to have something that non-ritonavir boosted. And just to point out that enstitrovir was approved in Japan um, uh, uh, for people um, at uh, both the low and high risk. The data supported that. There's limited data in high risk individuals. Um, but so there is some uh, uh, traction for use of other non-ritonavir boosted protease inhibitors not approved in the US and studies still ongoing. And then lastly, just to say, well, what about monoclonal antibodies? Are we gonna have new ones? Well, I think it's possible to, to develop these and there's certainly really good science that's ongoing showing that there's good targets and that we can develop broadly neutralizing antibodies. I think the question is just, is there gonna be the money and the political will to support the development of these drugs? And in my mind, the real need is particularly for pre-exposure prophylaxis for high-risk people. The only reason that we have the drugs that we do is that there was an enormous investment um, uh, uh, through the US government and NIH and others um, to help develop these drugs. And I, this has really dried up for drug development and particularly in monoclonal antibodies. Um, so I'm worried that although there's a really big unmet need that we may not see this uh, uh, come to market certainly in the same ways that we did uh, with other monoclonals earlier in, um, earlier in uh, the COVID epidemic. So I will stop there. That was meant to just be a quick snapshot of where I where where things stand and happy to answer uh, any questions. Great. Thank you, Anita. That was terrific. Um, and I think Peter and Monica may come back on. This. Let me start with a few. Um, so a lot of questions in the Q&A about the timing of Paxlovid. Uh, let me frame it in two different ways. There's was some thinking that the course needed to be longer to prevent rebound, some thinking that you should wait a few days to start it, and some thinking, and I hear this a lot, I'll wait to see how I feel on day four. And if I feel okay, I'm not, not gonna take it. And if I feel crummy, I will. Is, is any of that rational, any science behind any of those issues? All right, I'm gonna start with the last one, mostly just because of my memory. But um, I think that if, if you're gonna take treatment for, for COVID, and particularly if you have risk factors, and again, I think the data are most robust for those folks, I would take it as soon as possible. I don't think it makes sense to say, well, you know, yes, I made the diagnosis on day one, I felt lousy. Your best chance, if you're taking this because you don't want the disease uh, to progress, you don't want there to be complications, as with most viral diseases, I would treat it early. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't just wait and see what, what shakes out if you think there's a good reason to be treated. But now, yeah, I guess in terms of the natural history, it's not just the waiting, this all theory that, you know, if you wait a little bit, you give your immune system a chance to rev up and therefore you want to rebound. But more, I feel not terrible on day four. I've just got a bad scratchy throat and, you know, feel a little fatigued. Is it true that, you know, I guess part of the situation, part of the question is, have I lowered the likelihood I'm going to have a pretty severe case by virtue of not being all that sick on day three or four? I, I mean, Maybe uh, we've certainly seen, you know, the trajectory is a little bit all over the place. Most people who, you know, have been vaccinated or been infected or a combination, you know, don't get terrible disease. But all the disease that most of us have had has been, quote unquote, mild. And it doesn't mean that you don't feel lousy and you aren't out of commission for quite some time. I don't know. I had COVID and that was my experience. And it was that was mild disease. So right. and it may really drag on. And I think it's pretty hard to predict. Um, so if you're thinking about being treated and if you qualify for that, I'd be worried that you get out of the window and also that you've really lost your window. You know, for, for viruses, the sooner we can treat them, I think the better off we will be. And to my knowledge, the data that I've seen about trying to avoid PAX rebound, um, when they've looked for people treated early, you know, it, can you treat too early? That really hasn't shaken out. Um, we don't understand it that well. I will say that molnupiravir is also associated with rebound, so it's not unique to Paxlovid. And then we also know that people in just the natural history of disease itself can get a bump in, in, in viral load that without being treated at all, and then very interestingly, if you track people just with their symptoms, um, and this was from the active two studies, they've showed that you know, people will have a bump in symptoms and then you, you, you test them and their RNA is negative. So you might feel lousy in 10 days and blame it on your Paxlovid and it, it wasn't due to that. Rebound is real, but I think there's a mix of the virus can go up, maybe your symptoms are, uh, go up and those two are not always aligned with each other. Any, any evidence that a longer course would be helpful or that just hasn't that, been studied? That is a, a great question. We don't have that data. As I understand that was being explored. Um, Paxlovid has a pretty short half-life. It's about six hours if I have my numbers right. So it may be that they just undershot the mark and yeah. it would really, it, 
we don't know, like maybe eight days would have been a better um, amount of time. I will say that when they went back and looked at the, the, the data, you know, the PK doesn't seem to determine whether or not people got um, Paxlovid, uh, whether or not they got rebound, but, 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 you know, whether they got in a longer course, if that would make you better, we just don't know the answer to that. And there are drugs that are in development that have a longer half-life. So even if they're given for five days, you'd get a longer tail, a little bit like azithromycin. Yeah. The, the, the CEO of Pfizer took eight days, by the way. Uh, can I bring Peter on for a second? Because the question, if Evishel doesn't work, what you're doing with immunocompromised people now is, and you take care of a lot of them. So what do you do that, for them? What do you tell them? Are you still giving Evishel? As, as Annie said, it still is, has not been pulled yet, although it might be eventually. I think for immune compromised folks, it's really a vexing situation. Um, but I think what we're doing is focusing on post-diagnosis uh, treatment in case people break through. And uh, at UCS, a lot of people around the country weren't even using Paxlovid because they were worried about interactions with calcineurin inhibitors. But at UCSF, working with the pharmacists, they figured out a way to do that safely. Uh, so that those would be the ways that we approach it. But there's no real great um, uh, you know, strategy except making sure that people get adequately immunized and up-to-date on vaccines. And, thinking about when they get vaccinated in relationship to when they were most severely immunocompromised. Right. Are you still recommending Evishel to people or you stopped? We stopped. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Annie, thank you so much. I want to make sure we have time for Steve. So really appreciate it. It was really uh, uh, terrific overview of where we are. Uh, Steve, come on on and uh, tell us about where we are with long COVID. I know there's a ton to cover in a short period of time. Yeah, Bob, as you know, we don't have a lot of hardcore data in the long COVID world. So what I'm going to talk about is largely what the questions are, where I think things are going, and I'll go fast so that we can actually have time for some discussion. Um, so here are my disclosures, none actually relevant to COVID. Um, just definitions, right? So what I'm going to be talking about long COVID, long COVID is this very vague syndrome. Um, we all sort of know about it. It's actually very hard to describe. It's all these kind of um, uh, nonspecific symptoms that emerge within weeks uh, of a COVID diagnosis that can persist for months and many of them can be quite disabling. When you hear about long COVID though in, in, the, in the press, particularly some of the studies that are coming out from the large medical record systems, they're not really talking much about long COVID because that's actually something really difficult to sort of pick up in a medical record. Uh, we all know how terrible doctors are at, at actually documenting what they're doing. And it is a rather vague syndrome. What you're often hearing about is new onset diabetes, new onset heart disease, new onset strokes, clots, and so forth. Um, and that that is real. That that is that is happening, and it's actually not that surprising. We see an excess risk of all these morbidities after influenza, for example. So what I'm talking about here is the long COVID, which is part of this uh, umbrella definition of post-acute sequela of, of SARS-CoV-2. All right, how common? Who's at risk? So there have been. I can't keep track of this anymore. There, there are, there are fun, these things are being deposited on the web on a daily basis. Everybody with access to some kind of medical record system is reporting back on how common this is, using different definitions and getting different answers. I, I, I like this one because it's relatively representative in terms of how they went about doing it, but I actually like the answer. The answer sort of is an average of what most of the studies are seeing, which is that basically those people who are in a post-COVID situation maybe 10% plus or minus um, probably are having really significant persistent symptoms that are real that last for four months. And the predictors though are, are very, very common, um, very, very consistent. Older age, middle age actually maybe a bit more than older age, but certainly older than young. Female is a very strong consistent predictor here. And I think that may be providing some insights into the biology. Um, lower education, socioeconomic systems, the, the usual things that we see are also having an, a significant effect for mechanisms that have yet to be defined. But the issues of vaccine. So in study after study after study, with few exceptions, if you've been vaccinated, you're less likely to develop long-term symptoms. Um, and in some recent data, which is really preliminary, but kind of consistent with what we're seeing in the clinics, the current epidemic of Omicron and presumably Omicron siblings to come, the relative risk of developing long COVID seems lower. Some papers have argued actually it's disappeared 
And whether that's because the virus is different or everyone's got pre-existing immunity, who knows? But there is some a sense among those of us doing this that the really common, really severe long COVID was a phenomenon of the first few waves, 2020 up through Delta. Um, are there tests? There are lots of stories coming out that the virus persists in fat cells, myeloid cells, who knows? Um, and as a consequence, there are these tests being developed, very much like viral load for HIV. Can we measure the virus in people? There's one provocative study that does suggest you can measure the spike protein in the blood. And those people who have high levels of sp spike protein in the blood for months to over a year are the ones with long COVID. That needs to be confirmed, but there's a lot of interest in developing biomarkers, uh, but nothing yet. Um, can it, Manny mentioned this, um, perhaps we'll have some discussion. It is a, a somewhat of a controversial study, but there is one study from the VA, again, largely looking at the comorbidities, the heart disease and the cancer, and not really long COVID, even though that, that's how it was picked up in the press. But there is this one big study from the VA in vets, so not necessarily all that generalizable, but it does suggest something that we often thought makes sense is that if you actually treat the acute infection, you'll have a lot less risk of developing long-term consequences. And this is a question that always comes up. Should I, I know Monica tells me my T cells are gonna keep me out of the hospital, that's fine. Um, but T cells are not gonna prevent long COVID. Should I get, should I do um, Paxlovid to prevent long COVID? And the only data we have is basically this, suggesting that it's something to consider. Um, to me, there's been a lot of controversy as to whether long COVID's real. There are definitely people who are, are skeptical, but it's a, f a fascinating journey, if you want to go on it, to look at what actually has happened after Ebola and a whole long list of infections. And the, and the outcomes, females, sex predominance, 10% plus or minus, nonspecific symptoms lingering for, for years. It's, it's, every one of these infections has a story that's very similar to long COVID, which to me suggests it's real and that there's probably some universal uh, uh, explanation that we need to figure out. All right, why is it happening and what to do about it? Uh, five major mechanisms. The acute infection causes irreversible harm. The acute infection doesn't go away and there's a chronic infection that causes ir harm. There's a chronic inflammatory condition. There are autoantibodies running around the body doing bad things to your organs and there's this, and it's a very popular now in, 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 the, in various different networks, this whole concept that, is that the virus or the inflammation or the autoantibodies or the tissue damage is leading to microvascular clotting, which is causing damage. All this is actually something, each of these pathways have popped up in other syndromes, particularly HIV. Um, and, and so it does make sense to begin to think about therapies. And so each of these mechanisms right now are about to be tested in a series of studies, some funded by the NIH, some funded by industry, some funded by foundations, um, um, in which we're gonna try to basically intervene in these various pathways to understand the biology uh, and perhaps to identify new interventions. But in the meantime, um, um, there are, what, what are, what are, what's actually happening in the, in the clinics these days, the NIH is about to, to put, to, is about to launch a very large 1700 patient study of people with existing long COVID. This is not what Annie was talking about, acute infection, but months later they have long COVID. Can we get rid of it with Paxlovid? Our group and many other groups back in 2022, early on, had all these anecdotes of people who were really sick, took Paxlovid because they had another exposure and felt great. Um, and so essentially the study is about to launch and, and there will be um, uh, availability here, particularly in San Francisco. Um, but in the meantime, um, what do people do? And essentially, if they're in the Bay Area and they're lucky, they get into the clinic that's run by Lakshmi Santosh, who's, who's on the panel. She's running a, um, a post-hospitalization uh, um, COVID clinic, probably the premier COVID, long COVID clinic in, in the area. Um, tough to get into, but, but, but even if you can't get into the clinics, her group is able to find other uh, colleagues who can help out. Um, that's about UCSF. And then Michael Peluso, who's, who's a colleague of mine at UCSF, at UCSF and runs our big long COVID program, 
uh, has just tremendous amount of real world experience um, and accessing him through the clinical studies that we do is something that a lot of people have done. And, and he's again, got a lot of experience and wise advice, but essentially, as you can see here for now, we don't have anything specific to do rehabilitation, um, support and so forth is, is, is generally what's being offered. But we like people to get involved in the cohorts of the clinics so that we can get them access to these clinical trials as they come about. And with that, Bob, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, what a fascinating, <laughs> complicated topic. Are any of the, given the five different pathophysiologies, you would assume that drug A will not work against pathophysiology D. Is there any effort to parse people into them being at risk of any of the different pathophysiologies? Because we don't have biomarkers, we can't do that. You just have to try drugs and undifferentiated populations. It seems like a daunting problem. It's, it, <laughs> daunting <laughs> is an understatement, right? Yeah. So th there is, you know, this isn't like acute COVID where you give a person a drug and you count the number of people who go into the hospital. That's easy, right? right? So, you know, in long COVID, there are all these buckets, right? People have the brain fog version. People have the palpitation uh, version. People have, you know, kind of the chronic fatigue version. People have um, what's called POTS. Uh, people have chronic pain. There's so there are different subgroups, and we think some of them have been related to more inflammation or less. So it's, it's possible that there are different phenotypes with different mechanisms, although I don't really find that particularly appealing, right? Right. I mean, if, you're this, if you're fatigued, it's not clear, you know, that could be from too much virus or it could be from autoimmunity. It could be from microclots. It could be anything, right? Yeah. So essentially right now we're, we're separating people into different groups. We're giving them all the same intervention for the most part. And we're hoping that at least one group will respond to one intervention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's a mess. Yeah. As you've come to understand the pathophysiology and you've looked hard at the prevalence, how does that change your personal behavior or what you recommend to people include in terms of what we talked about before, vaccination? Are you more careful masking and other th and, and indoor restaurants because you look long COVID in the eye every day or, or you, you, it doesn't change your behavior? No, I'm, I'm far more um, conservative than, than Monica is. And Monica and I, We've had hallway debates about this for three years now, um, right? Um, she does not. She does not concern as much about this. She's obviously focused on preventing people from end up hospitalizing and dying. But I keep saying, okay, infection is not benign, right? Yes, you can you can use vaccines and stay out of the hospital, but the infection itself is not benign. You can infect others, but you can also get this long term stuff. And vaccines will blunt. It won't prevent the infection, but will blunt the burst of virus during that infection, as will antiviral. So, so no, I'm, I've definitely freed up. Of, I mean, I had COVID over the summer, and Bobby gave me some great advice on what to do. After that, to be honest, I became a bit more um, liberal, going to restaurants and so forth. But, but you know, I I like my 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 masks. They don't bother me that much. I've kept up with my vaccines, including the boosters, and I'm doing it primarily to prevent this long-term stuff. So yep. I'm afraid of the virus. Yeah, I'm, I'm more with you than, than uh, you know, it, I, I think there, it, there are sort of reasonable alternative views here, but, but yeah, I no longer have any fear that I'm going to die of it uh, as I, you know, unlike March 2020 when I was hiding at the kitchen table. But it really is all of this. If those prevalence numbers are anything near right and the consequences are anything near right, uh, then at least to me, it, it, it argues for some caution, particularly when the prevalence is high. Um, you're, you, you made the point that we see long flu, long Ebola, long whatever. Do we see it at anything like these prevalence numbers? And is it the same multitude of pathophysiologies or, or, you know, or, are, they, or are they very different? Um. Here I'll put on my community activist hat that I always wear when I'm in the HIV world too. But it, it, it's the the problem is that these syndromes were largely ignored by the biomedical field and didn't get a lot of funding, didn't get a lot of respect, and people really had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, so, and those the, and and there's a very powerful advocacy groups from each of those syndromes that are now at the front, you know, 
advising us on how to handle long COVID. The idea being that long COVID will explain exactly what happened with Lyme, what's happened with Ebola and so forth. Um, so, and there's a beautiful nature medicine review um, that I was a part of, I wish I was, that, that just went through comprehensively what, what is known about long flu and long Ebola and long this and that. And, and it's, you read this and you go, oh my God, this is the same story. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously the, the, the papers were never all that rigorous. There was not that much funding, but again, if you just, if you go superficially and just look at the trend lines, there's a lot of similarities between what's happened with COVID and what's happened with these previous infections. Suggesting to me, it's not spike protein on COVID that's a problem. It's, it's something that a, an acute viral infection or even bacterial infection does to your body that is very nonspecific. The obvious thing being chronic inflammation and clotting. Um, and so that's where our group um, is going, partly because of that reason. And what would it, we only have a couple of minutes left, what would the female gender be? How, why would that be associated? Uh, well, it didn't, um, it, and again, it's remarkably understudied, um, despite it being a really important issue, is is the fact that why are, why are females so much higher at risk for all these autoimmune diseases, right? So I've been in, in asking all the rheumatologists that I know, why do, you know, why is lupus, why is children's, why are all these, you know, all immune from, why are they so much more common? I mean, sometimes dramatically more common in women. And is it, is it related to, uh, is it related to um, hormones? Is it more common in the premenopausal, postmenopausal? Is it, do we think it's related genetically? I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of the major pathways that are associated with inflammation are tied to the X chromosome. And so there's different doses like of TRLR7, for example, that's often brought up, but we, we actually, we, we don't know the answer to this. Yeah, strange. But, yeah. Uh, so maybe let's end with, with this. You're in the middle of this. It strikes me as an enormous issue. It's gonna play out in the healthcare system over many years, a lot of funding and interest in research. Uh, are you hopeful or not? Let's say a year from now, do you think we'll have treatments? No. Really? No, we won't have treatments in a year. We'll have. We have, so what's happening right now is that um, we're building massive cohorts. A billion and a half dollars from NIH is going to these cohorts, kids, adults, autopsy cohorts, everything. Um, and, and now the biologists, many of them from worlds I've worked with forever, HIV, are now bringing their intellect and resources to answer the question. I think in a year, we will have made major advances in understanding the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And we will and then be doing more rationally designed interventional studies designed to cure this. But that those treatments typically will take three to five years to get across the finish line. So you don't think we're going to serendipitously sort of stumble our way into a treatment based on the shotgun approach without really understanding the physiology? I, um, I'm, I, I'm hopeful that Paxlovid will do the trick, but I'm doubtful it will do it for more than a, a small proportion. Yeah, great. All right. Well, thank you all to all of our speakers. A really fascinating, far-ranging session. Just shows there's still a lot of action here and a lot we need to learn and makes me proud to be here with all of these uh, wonderful colleagues who are thinking about different aspects of it. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you back again for a non-COVID Grand Rounds next week. And until then, stay dry and stay well. And thanks so much.